Okay, so let's wrap up this genes within populations lecture. This is our fourth part. This one should be relatively short compared to the others. Um, what we, again, I want to stress is evolution is looking at the change in the gene frequencies within populations, not individuals, not one organism, but populations. So hundreds of horses, hundreds of pea plants, hundreds and thousands of um, minnows, whatever it might be. We're looking at gene frequencies in the populations, the alleles, and are those frequencies changing? So we talked about the five agents that cause change. Make sure you guys know those. We looked at examples of those agents that cause change. And as they're changing, the populations are going through selection. So the first type of selection we talked about in the last lecture was what we called disruptive. So a quick review here, disruptive selection is when, for whatever reason, both extreme phenotypes are favored. So the really, really big, the really, really small, whatever the trait is or the traits, the ends of the spectrum are favored over time, over generations, generation after generation after generation. All right, so here's a real exa real life example when we look at different species of birds. Sometimes the medium beaks are bad. That average beak size, no good. You can't crack a big seed because you're not strong enough, and you can't crack a small seed because you're too big. So if you have a really big beak, you're going to eat certain seeds. If you have a really small beak, you're going to eat other seeds. You're not competing because you're eating different seeds. But the medium-beaked birds just don't survive. So those alleles get less and less common in the population, and the frequencies of those alleles change over time and over generations and generations and generations. Okay, so that is what we call disruptive selection. Now, sometimes selection occurs, and we call this a directional selection. Now in directional selection, one end of the spectrum is favored. So for whatever reason, being really big is good. And generation after generation after generation, the bigger you are, the more likely you are to survive. Or maybe it's smaller and smaller and smaller. But directional is the most frequent phenotype is at the end of the spectrum. So a real-life example here are horses. <clears throat> so about 60-some million years ago, horses, the ancestor of the horses we see on Earth today, the great, 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 add a lot of greats to it, great-grandparents of our horses were these things or this species or this group called hyracotherium. They were pretty darn small. They lived in the rainforest, they ran around through the undergrowth, they had four toes, and being small was adaptable. That was advantageous. You could crawl under trees, you could run up the side of some of the trees, you know, if they were at an angle, not straight up, but that was adaptable for that environment. And over time, the body size of the horse started getting bigger. Now, there's lots of offshoots from the horse evolutionary tree. Some of them got medium size, some got this size, that size, and those lines dead ended. But what we see is over 60 some million years, the average body size of the horse continued to get larger and larger and larger. It was more adaptable. And the correlation, if you look in the fossil record, going from Hyracotherium to Merichippus to Equius, and this is jumping tens of millions of years, the environment changed. So these guys were adaptable and fit when they were living in a jungle environment. As jungles decreased and more grasslands appeared, it was more adaptable to be bigger. So we got to this size. As we get into big open areas, large plains, big stretches of grassland being really, really big, like our modern horses, were the most adaptable variations. So we see a directional selection favoring larger body size over 
millions and millions of years, tens of millions of years, and millions and millions of generations. Okay, again, think about horses today. You can't really take them into a forest. They're not adaptable to that environment. So being big is perfect if you're running across the prairie in the open grasslands of the Midwest or out west in Arizona and Kansas and those places where it's wide open. But you put horses into jungles and forests, being small is more adaptable. Okay, So that's a directional selection. One phenotype is favored. Now the third type is what we call stabilizing. In stabilizing selection, the average phenotype is favorable. All right, so being in the middle, that's perfect. Let's look at humans. The average birth weight, and when we talk about human birth weight, we've got to go with full-term pregnancy, natural delivery. Let's get rid of C-sections for this scenario. We're not considering C-sections, we're not considering preemies, we're not considering all those other factors involved. Just imagine taking the data from a thousand babies born this week in the local hospitals, full, well if we had that many, but a thousand babies born, full-term pregnancy, natural delivery. Birth weight's going to average roughly around seven pounds. Yes, there is a spectrum. We can see babies as small as 2 pounds and babies up into 15 and 16 pounds. But what we've seen over the course of human evolution, 100,000 plus years of human evolution, is our birth weight has stabilized around that 7 pound mark. So consider delivery. When a woman's in child in labor, giving birth, childbirth, it's a very stressful process on her body, a very demanding process. If the baby was extremely large, 14, 15 pounds, it would be difficult for childbirth. Even though the baby's going to be well-developed, a big, gigantic, bouncing baby, the, develop, the childbirthing process could kill the mother. And in today's society, we have medical intervention to save the mother's life, C-section, etc. But I'm talking about, let's go back 400 years. If mom was trying to birth a 14-pound baby, the doctors weren't doing C-sections. The odds are the child might have died, mother may have died as well during childbirth if it was too large of a baby. Now you go to the other side of the spectrum, and a really tiny baby, 2 pounds, 2.5 pounds, natural full-term pregnancy, natural delivery, yeah, that baby would come out much easier, provided mom wasn't very, very, very tiny herself, but an easy delivery for a very small baby might mean an underdeveloped baby that doesn't survive. So we have stabilized with our species around the seven pound mark with birth weight of humans. What will be fascinating is if we could come back in about 15,000 years, if humans are still around, and look at what is the average? Because as you consider all of the medical intervention that takes place during a lot of pregnancies, C-sections, preemies, premature babies being born and surviving, all those things will contribute to changing the selection. We're actually moving away from natural selection and fitness when we use medical intervention. Not that I'm saying it's a bad thing by any means, but it is definitely going to change our distribution or our selection, but it's going to take tens of thousands of generations before we see that change significantly happening. All right, so all these types of selection contribute to changing the species. It's a way to watch and actually map and see the species change over generations, if you can see enough generations. So the challenge with what Humans, we can't watch 15,000 generations. With horses, we can't see 15,000 generations. With birds, eh, we might be able to see it, depending on the bird and how long you can watch. But realistically, we can't watch this unless we look at things like bacteria and weeds and fruit flies. In certain species, we can watch this selection happening. 
But what it does is over time, selection leads to new species, the evolution of new species. And given enough time, that new species is different than the ancestral species. So you consider our tiger down here and our house cat here, domesticated cat. They share certain traits that say this makes them relatives related to each other. They are cousins on the evolutionary tree. And we can look at the evolution of the cat and look at that cat family tree and work backwards and see all the different points where different species have diverged off. So at this 108 million year ago split, this lineage called Panthera said, let's get bigger. Bigger is better. The lineage going the other direction, didn't select for that. As different lineages broke off, certain features were adaptable, and that's what led to the evolution of those groups of cats. And it continued over 100, 800, 10, 100, whatever million years to give us the diversity of cats that we have out there today. So they have gone through selection. They've gone through the five agents of evolutionary change, and those have caused those species to evolve and the new species to appear. So this creates the diversity of life on Earth as we know it today.